So yeah, hello everyone. My name is Mio Pongowski, as Arthur just said, and I'd like to tell you a little bit about the modules in the C++. Um, so what can you expect from this talk? Even though modules are a relatively new and only partially implemented feature, there is a lot to cover. And I don't want this talk to be too much taken. So I'll try to keep it simple, stupid, you know, the case principle, so that it's a good introduction, which may lead to any of you actually testing modules on your own. And first, we'll ask ourselves, why do we need such change? Uh, what is the current situation and what's wrong with it? Then we'll talk a little bit about what uh, modules are in a very basic way. We'll go through a couple of code examples to see how does it work. And lastly, I'll leave you with some information regarding when we can expect uh, modules to become fully usable and what may be needed for it. Well, why do we need the change? Isn't our current build system impeccable? Um, let me do some really crude crash course on the C++ build system, as maybe not all of us are aware of it, uh, you know, how it works inside. So we have header and implementation files. These are, you know, the H and CPP files. And in, this fi in these files, we have uh, some pros or macros, like defines, includes, and pragmas, and the code, like you know, methods, structs, variables, right? And first, we have a preprocessor pass that takes a look at macros and it replaces all the defines with its values and replaces all includes with the content of included header files. And let me highlight this: each include statement basically pays the whole content of a header file, and yeah, and that's why we use pragma ones or if not dev cards as well. Uh, because we don't not you know we don't want the duplicates and the endless pasting of the headers. Okay, so after this preprocessor pass, we no longer have headers. They have been pasted into proper CPP files, and each of these is a translation unit on its own. We compile each CPP file to object code file, and lastly, we feed all the object files into the linker, which glues all the code together and checks if all symbols needed can be found in the you know supplied files. So, okay, we have this. Now that we know these basics, uh, we can talk about one of the main problems, which is copying. And so pasting whole header files leads to a couple of problems that modules may be a cure for. So the first one would be a huge file sizes. For example, a one-liner hello world program that you know simply uses IO stream for printing and prints hello world has about 100 bytes file size. But after a preprocessor pass, it will have almost 660,000 bytes, uh, which can be seen on, for example, on Godbolt. You can pass the capital E uh, flag uh, to, the GP, to the G++, and it will basically show you the preprocess file. And this is because it just pastes the, the IO stream header, and that's what you know bloats the file. And this bloated file is the input for the compiler. So we can easily imagine that there must be an overhead when parsing the extra stuff that we not necessarily use on each compilation of the CPP file, because it's not like we use all of the IO stream. No, we need some stuff from there. And well, we basically compile it on, you know, on each go. And also we've had name duplication for method structs. We may get some ugly errors that are not always readable because they will relate to the preprocess file and not the one that we are working with. But that's mainly you know, dealt with pragma ones or, or uh, if not dev guards. Um, and, but if we have, for example, name duplication for define, the include order uh, will change the value of define. And I must say, I myself had experience with weird bugs stemming just from the header include order. You know, And when you change the order, the program works. When you change it back again, it doesn't. Um, other thing is that people often tend to add includes that are required by the, by the compiler instead of all that are needed by the code, because maybe some file that we are actually including already includes a couple of other headers that we are using, so you do not include them. But then if you try to copy the code uh, and use it somewhere else, you have problem because there are a lot of headers that you haven't actually included yourself. and. <clears throat> this whole mess stems from the copying as well, you know, the, the header copying. Um, so yeah, uh, I'm hoping that we'll get rid of this. 
Also, many people that have heard about modules suggested that there's a lot of new semantics, a lot of new problems, right, which are not needed. And we have already PCH, we have pre-compiled headers. They kind of serve the same issue, right? The compilation is faster. You don't need to get over the same headers uh, you know, over and over. And, but even if the main performance gains may be similar, the similarity actually ends here and modules bring more cleanliness and a better code isolation. Uh, for example, we'll talk about internal method flicking uh, with, with templates later on. Okay, so let's go to what? We can see you know, that the need for the change is already there, but let's talk about what this change actually is. I think that most CPP developers have heard about modules proposal at least once in their career. It's you know understandable as the first draft of the modules was submitted in 2004, so like 18 years ago by David uh, van der Voort. And there was a long wait period. And in 2012, a dedicated st study group, SG2, uh, was created. And then another five years later in 2017, there was a first implementation that appeared in MSVC and Clang, or CLANG as some people call it. Uh, and in 2018, a year later, there was a technical specification, modules TS. Uh, it was finalized and also Google proposed their ATOM, which is an acronym for another take on modules. A year later, 2019, both of these were merged and the outcome of this merge was the C++20 committee draft, which is basically the version that uh, we'll be talking about here. And I'm presenting here, it's, it's what we have. So the main difference that modules bring, in my opinion, is the removal of header copying, which solves all the problems that stem from it. And apart from that, there are also mechanics that should allow people for, um, should allow people uh, better library management and be, by being able to span translation unit across several times, or maybe exporting only explicitly specified subsets of the content in the modules. Okay, we know why, we know what. Let's dive into practical examples. As modules have several things that are far easier to understand via practice than theory. Um, though, let me be clear, theory is also important, but I didn't want to blow this talk too much. Also, please note that all of the shown examples later on uh, are fully functioning codes tested on the setup visible on the slide. So, you know, um, this one, give me a second. Oh, this one here, right? Uh, and it was G11, there was also Clang 11, and there was also MSVC, but I will be using only G uh, in these examples. So, let's start with a well known Hello World example. First, let's have a look at the main CPP file. Uh, we can see the first new keyword that is import. And here we are just simply importing module name mod. And later on, we just call in function func, which is not declared anywhere in this file, right? Okay. On the right, you can see the func.cxx file. And please note that the extension cxx is not final. It's not standardized. Uh, there are, you know, acceptable extensions vary between compilers, and the one that I'm using is for G++. Anyway, let's start with the export module mod line. We have two keywords here. We have, uh, let me highlight it, export and the module. Uh, first one, is, let's, let's talk about module first. And the module mod marks the beginning of the module translation unit, and here we have a start of a of the uh, module mod pair view. I think it's called pair view uh, explicitly. So everything after this uh, is a part of the module name mod. So we have the all function func with quite an obvious body, a simple hello world. And we have two places where the other keyword, export keyword is used. First time it's used in the, with the module declaration over here. And this, addition of this export um, actually makes marks this module as visible outside. It marks this file as a module interface file. And the second time is with the function func, you know, before it, which marks this function as visible whenever someone imports this module. 
So we have one more part of this file, which is a sole module uh, word at the top. And this is actually a special case of model declaration, because normally you can have only one model declaration per file, but this special case um, and the lack of the model name makes this a global module declaration. This special declaration is used for two things. First, for the file with the with main function, there is no module keyword there, but the main function exists in the global module module purview, and you are not allowed by the standard to put the main function anywhere else. Um, and the second one is for using preprocessor macros in modules. For example, I have used include IO stream in here uh, because it's not my library, it's a header, you know, some other header, so we, I had to import it somehow. Um, and yeah, and below you can see the comments for compiling this simple example. We have first compiled, we first compiled both files to object files, the function CXX and main CPP, and then in the end, we just link them into exec table. So it's not that much more work than, than normally, I think. There are a couple of files that are created over there, like for the, each module, there are special intermediary files that are later on used. Um, but these also differ depending on the compiler, a bit MSVC Clank or, or um, G++. So I'll stick to the code in here. And if any of you will be interested in this later on, you can just take on these examples and, you'll, and uh, play with them yourself and see what is created when, et cetera. So with modules, we can split the code into declaration and implementation as with the headers. So on the last slide, I didn't tell the whole truth because the export model mod um, and kind of, kind of did, kind of didn't, um, uh, because I did say that the export module mod marked the beginning of the module interface, but we can actually use it without export module mod, and this will mark the module implementation. And you can see that the export keyword is used only in the interface files. So it's, you know, with the method used over here uh, with the method declaration, but the method implementation over here doesn't have it and doesn't need it as well. Um, yeah, and you can, you can also see that I moved the include team to the main CPP. So there is no global module declaration in the, in the uh, module files. Because as I said previously, it's one of the special cases where it's used and the main method G++, it allows something the declaration. So I can just put the include over there without you know, having any uh, fear that the compiler will scream at me. And so now that we know, you know the basics of the module usage, we can create some basic modules. Let's check uh, export keyword all closer. On the right side, you can see that there's no problem with exporting different overloads of the same method, of course. Um, also, there's no need for repeating export for each function. We can simply uh, create a, an export block, which is done for functions B and C, as you can see over here in the, uh, uh, on the right side. And as you can see in the main file, the result is the same and we can simply call them. So. Um, you can see that, yeah, we can either export a method on its own or in a block, and it's all visible. There's you know, no difference whatsoever. Here we have variations of namespaces, which are also fully supported. We have namespace A name with different exported methods inside. And underneath, we have a whole namespace B name exported with methods inside as well. As you can see in the main file, the result is the same for both of them. So both of them have their namespaces uh, visible and the namespace got exported. And even though in here we export the method from inside the namespace and then here we export the whole namespace. Um, the one important thing to note is that is I think as you, some of you may actually know, uh, uh, know when exporting the whole namespace, there's no way of omitting a single function. When you export, when you write it, the block like this, everything gets exported. When you write the block like this, you can export some of the functions, but you don't need to export all of them. It's, it's not like you have to. Um, the other way around is you could 
create export time strains B name with a couple of methods, and then just create another uh, scope for the namespace BM without the export keyword. So you have a couple of methods in the, you know, in the namespace, in the same namespace. You have the names exported, but only a couple of the symbols from within it, right? So if we would mark this B name as well, and we move export from some of them, then we would have you know, all of the supported and only some of these. Um, you can also export classes with no problem and functions that take classes as arguments. I think that there's nothing new here, just I think export before the class keyword over here. And the rest can be done with public, private, and protected keywords as has always been with class in C++. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not sure if I can remove the, okay, I remove the highlight. Um, yep, and it's basically, uh, let's leave it at this for the, for the classes, there's nothing more there. Um, and let's leave the whole export keyword for now and uh, take a look at how we can speed the module code uh, because that's, you know, another important part that I was talking about, uh, spanning, uh, spanning the translation unit across several files. So let's think how to do this. Uh, let's start from the bottom with math uh, mule for the multiplication. So we export module math mule, uh, math dot mule with a single function mule over here. Going up, we have math add, of course, which is basically the same but with add function. And at the top, we have module math, uh, which contains function power and very interesting math align export import math uh, dot mule. So this line basically says that we would like to import symbols from MathMul module. And you know, so they're visible inside the module, but also export them as a part of this module. So um, when anyone imports the math module, they will also um, they will also import whatever is in here because it got exported in here, right? So they will also kind of import a mule method as well. Um, and then we use the important power function in the uh, symbol. Uh, I mean, um, I'm sorry. I use the import. We use the important uh, mule symbol in here in the power function, so we know that it's visible. And then it's also in here. Uh, so let's start with these two imports. We have the math and math point add dot add, or whatever you call it. Um, we use power function from math, and then we use add function from add and mule function from multiplication, right? So we know that the power is visible from math. We know the mule is visible from math because it's from this export import, right? And we have the add function from this one, which wasn't in the math itself, it's like separate module. And uh, this does that you see, the math.mule, math.add, et cetera. Uh, it's something that people refer to as submodules. But as a matter of fact, it doesn't hold any special meaning in the, in the standard. The dots are just allowed characters in the module name. So each of these math, math.add, math and math.mule, each of these modules are actually separate, completely separate modules. And for the compiler, there's no specific relation between them. The name is readable for us, of course, but it doesn't hold any specific meaning for the for the compilator, for the com, uh, for the compilator. Um, but what if they actually could hold a specific meaning? So here we have partitions. You can notice that we've changed the dots to the semicolons. And partitions are marked via module name followed by a semicolon, as I've said, and then followed by a partition name. Uh, moreover, they cannot be used outside of the translation unit they belong to. So like in the previous example, we had math add added in here as well, imported, it's not possible. The math add is only a math semicolon add. So the add partition of a math module can only be used and important inside the math module itself. Um, so the way this code is divided in here is the same as a sub example. Um, and another thing worth noting, mainly the move partition at the bottom, there are no exports there. Uh, as you can see, um, and um, and in the map mode we only import 
Moodle partition, so it's actually used only internally in the module. We don't export it, right? And we could change import mule to export import over here, right? But because over here we don't have any export, this would change nothing. So we can see that in this example, we have used this multiplication method as an internal implementation, some internal you know, methods that are needed in the main module and nothing more, it's not exported outside. Um, also, another thing that is worth noting is that in current state, we would not be able to add export keyword in here without adding export keyword to the module itself as well. Because uh, the only place in the only place where you can have exports is in the uh, module interface file, which is started with an export module space module name. So we have this one here, we have this one here. But if you do not have export keyword uh, in the module statement, it's a module implementation file. And these do not, uh, in these, you are not allowed to actually use export keyword. So last example is a template exported. Uh, there's nothing pretty surprising here. We have just had an export keyword before template method declaration. Uh, for several different reasons, when declaring the template, the compiler needs to be aware of all specializations used before being able to compile the translation unit where the template function implementation writes in. So you know, so it no, it it must generate all the you know all the method that will be used in the code. So there is a couple of workarounds available, but the most common usage is just storing the implementation in the header, as is as as it was done in here, kind of. And it's also true for other internal methods referencing templates. So normally one could have like special name namespace called internal or secret or don't use that would hold the logic. And well, um, the problem with the solution is the programmer has no way of actually hiding the same rules apart from obscuring the name. You can obscure the name, you can make it, you know, um, not very intuitive for the developer to actually use this uh, namespace. Or you can try to you know, negotiate with him saying, hey, this internal, please don't use it. You are not supposed to use it. Um, but the models, on the other hand, allow us to export only the template while at the same time having internal implementation methods like the size to bit size in here. And these methods will not leak into the global namespace uh, because they have a module linkage. This is uh, another important thing, but the module linkage I will actually um, omit in the stock, maybe maybe in a later one. But the important thing is that the size to bit size will not be available in the uh, main and it's not leaked. So that's that is the difference. So these are actually all of the examples. And now that we are past all of them, let's think how further away the modules still are. First, the standard specification is out there. But the support is partial and differs between compilers. For example, the supported extension uh, vary between compilers as well as flags and ways in which compilers store generated module interface files. Uh, along with the presentation, I'll supply Feverstock Hello World example, one for each comp compiler written on the slides. I mean, the first one that you have seen uh, before was for the G, and then later on, there are two other ones for the client 11 and for the MSVC. And I have written which version of uh, CL from the BS, uh, I've tested from the BS22 community edition. Um, so yeah, I think that it may, you know, it may uh, be a starting guide for, for some of you if you want to have some, you know, have a code that was, uh, that is uh, sure to be compilable and, and you know and go from there. So as for the full support, we actually have no information on when that will happen as there are several problems that have to be resolved at the compiler level as well, not only you know the, the standard. And so these contain are not exclusive to discovering file location and exported modules as you know, the file names and the module names have actually no relation right now. You can have a file name. <clears throat> I think that we actually had a file name, fang.cxx, 
but inside it, there was a module name mod. So <clears throat> there is this discrepancy, right? Apart from that, there's extracting dependencies for a proper order of compilation, like which stuff I need to compile first, which module I need to compile first so that I can compile other modules so that I can compile other, you know, uh, translation units, some CPD files that use them, et cetera, et cetera, you know, and, and building whole compilation graph appropriately. So these, these problems <clears throat> are at the compiler level. Um, other thing uh, that I've heard is that the modularization of the standard headers is aimed at CPP 23. There is, there was, there was an attempt from the NSBC and they have, they have a couple of headers actually a couple of standard headers actually modularized so and people can use it via imports not via includes mm. they were quite fine but this is not a you know it's not standard it's only in, in msvc and i think that when people use c++ uh, they kind of prefer it to work on more than only one compiler mm. another important factor uh, when thinking about who support are the build tools uh, commonly used in the industry like CMake, Mesos, or Bazel. And I've seen that Bazel already offers some module support with Clang, but in my opinion, more tools need to support them for modules to actually be usable in the industry. Um, but on the other hand, why would, you know, these builders organizations sink time and money into this if no one actually uses them? So it's like a chicken and egg problem, right? You don't use modules because no one supports them, no one supports them because no one uses them, and, and so on and so on. And yeah, I think that this will conclude the talk. As I said, that I have these two examples, MSBC and CLANG, they're all on the slide. So th there's nothing, no, a surprise over there, uh, just proper comments. And I leave them over there uh, in, the, in the presentation. So it's much easier to find, I think, for everybody. So let's see, uh, does anyone have any questions maybe? Well, I do. So you said that the module and the object, well, the CP file are compiled uh, separately. And how does the compiler of the CPP file know exactly what's the definition of each function that is imported as the module is? Uh, okay, so let me jump to some slide that we, let's even do this one, okay? I think that this should be enough. So the question as far as I understood is how does compiler know that if we import mod that there will be fun function in there? Yes, and what's the definition of this function? Okay, so uh, first thing is that when we uh, compile modules, they are saved in like this intermediary uh, intermediary format that is basically going through the module, getting all the declarations, and saying, okay, so for this module, these are the declarations available, and the, each compiler, I think, has different formats for this. For example, MSVC has IFC uh, format for this. And when you compile any of these examples, there will be either these files or the sp special folder, folder with these files inside. And the compiler will actually look at those and based on them, uh, understand what the person are inside. Actually, there is, uh, I didn't talk about this in this talk, but the other important thing is that Inside the module, you can, you know, you can split it, you know, uh, between the declaration implementation, which would actually um, let you, uh, it would uh, let you not compile uh, the code every time when you change some implementation here, as long as the declaration stays the same. Right, so it's it's quite important. But uh, in here, I've actually used two files for it. But there is a special case like uh, a private partition where I could uh, I could write here the export void fun declaration and then write module um, space semicolon private and then underneath it uh, put the implementation and this private uh, private module partition. 
actually uh, designed in such a way that um, no changes over there are uh, should should in any way um, uh, should anyway make declaration you know get changed or get recompiled. So uh, yeah, that, that's, that's that's so it's that's basically like uh, link time code generation. Uh, I think so. Okay, and then the second question arises: uh, How does it play with inlines? Okay, so the inlines actually, uh, yeah. So with inlines, there was some problem, and uh, I left this as a little bit more advanced topic because it uh, also um, the inlines uh, also touch the topic of. Uh, the internal linkage, global linkage, and module linkage, and how they play with each other, etc. And the reachability versus visibility, which is, I think, either a new concept or a, a little bit redone concept in the modules. Um, as there is some stuff that you can have in modules that will not be visible per se, but will be usable. Um, I'm sorry, I, I went off on a tangent. Um, so so you showed the template function. Oh, usually, yeah. yeah. Usually we use such small template functions to be automatically inlined to oh, somewhere okay. else. Yeah. yeah. And the thing is that when we use the module, uh, compiler, well, at least from the draft, there is nothing to say that this function will be in line or not, or what will be, what will we, what will happen. Mm -hmm. So what, what I assume that for some reason, the modules are actually compiled to the target binary and the special header is used to just tell what the functions are. So probably that, isn't actually link time code generation, but something stripped. Okay, so I know there is um, also some other way of doing this. I think that the inlines, uh, if you don't paste the code itself, you know, you can, um, there is some flag in the, for the compilers. I'm sorry that I do not remember the name, but it kind of worked like this, um, that all of the, all of the usages of the same inline function are marked as all of these should be the same and look at the same place. And then compiler actually uh, scraps uh, all of this, uh, all of these reference from different translation units, knowing that you can use the first one he gets because they all should point in the same place. Um, there is some optimization for the compilers that, that has some special name. I'm sorry, I do not remember it at this time, but I can check it out uh, later on and send you um, the name. Yeah, would be nice. Thanks. No problem. Mm, any other questions? Okay, so I, I guess that would be it. Uh, thank you all for you know for attending and uh, thanks to thanks to Christian for, for his questions. Uh, it's also you know really nice to, to have some more insight. And um, yeah.